Praise be to God. Thank you, choir. Thank you, musicians. Thank you, congregation, for allowing God's presence to be demonstrated in this place. Amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God is in this place. The Holy Spirit is in this place. Amen. And just let somebody know, you know who brought him? Tell him if you're saved, thank you for bringing him. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you for allowing him to show up in you. Now, if you're not saved, we understand, but we want you to know that he desires that you be saved. I got to preach, y'all. Amen. Amen. Anybody want a word? Amen. Thank you. his holy name. This is Solidarity Sunday, isn't it? We say we have two services, but we're still one church. Amen. Amen. We are unified, not because of anything that we plan or we do, but because we are unified through our faith and our trust in Jesus the Christ under the guidance and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. Amen. Y'all, y'all are coming back fired up. Y'all want to take another week? <laughs> We've been on a week of rest. Amen. God bless your, your soul. Amen. We, we do have a passage of scripture that we do want to go to, but I do want to, I, I do want to go to the screen for a moment. Is that all right? Can we go to the screen just for a moment? We want to put up the model just for a moment amen and just as a refresher because we've been we've been on we've been we've been on uh rest for at least a week and some of you all it is so good to see you back you've been away and we thank god for the traveling grace that he extended unto you and we just thank god for your presence and we want to thank god for those who came home to visit family over the thanksgiving holidays and we thank god for your presence as well and if we have guests in the house we thank god that you thought enough to take time out of your schedule to come and to be present in the work in the in the worship experience but on my right you have the unsaved person self sits on the throne this is the person who continues to try and do things in their own strength they are not connected spiritually in the center we have the person that is called the the immature Christian. The T moves to the inside of the circle. The T represents Christ, the cross. This is the immature Christian. This is the person who says, I believe in Jesus Christ as my savior, but they're not growing and maturing and begin to trust him as their Lord. So they are connected spiritually, but they're not maturing spiritually. They are continuing to try and live the Christian life in their own ability, their own capacities, their own intelligence, their own strength. Their conversation, as I continue to say, you hear it like this, I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to live the Christian life. I'm trying to get over this. I'm trying, I am, I am, I am. They have not truly come to understand 
and become sensitive to the reality, the spiritual reality, that God has given them a helper to not for them to try, but to trust. That does, not ab that does not mean they abdicate. It does not mean they give up or give in. They do not give up their abilities, but they begin to trust that God is going to use their abilities, their str the strength that he gives them in order to show his power in their life. But they have not come to truly understand it to that level. Then you have the maturing Christian. This is not the person that's perfect, as I continue to say. This is not the person who do not have problems. This is not the person who do not experience emotional uh, 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 issues. This is not the person who do not have it all together. But the one thing that this person has come to realize is that God is real. They've come to realize that he is true to his word, to his promises. And they have come to grow because of their faith and their trust in what God says in his promises. So they began to walk by faith and not by sight. Look at where the T is now. It's on the throne. Which means they've surrendered their will, their way to the will and the way and the word and the power of the Holy Spirit and the word and the way of God. They have come to truly believe. That God is in control of their life. And they allow him through his presence of the Holy Spirit to guide, to lead their lives. To make them perfect. It just makes them available. It makes them willing. And they are willing to obey him even though in the midst of stress strain and struggles their faith helps them to have access to that which God has for them it transcends them in their mind in their will in their way to demonstrate the power of God in their lives, on their job, in their homes, in their community. But not perfect. They're just willing and available. They walk by faith and not by sight. Now, the question is, which one are you? There's a passage of scripture in Acts chapter 4, the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4, verse 36 through 37, if you would turn there. And I will say, take out your iPhones, take out your cell phones, take out your iPads, cut them on. Amen. If you have your Bibles on your iPhones, your iPads, your cell phones, whatever the case may be, that's okay to use. If you're one who have not actually um, 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 converted to those technological advances and you still have your heart back Bible, that's okay too. Amen. 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 Acts chapter 4, verses 36 and 37. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version, and it's what it says. Luke is writing. He's the author of Acts under the power of the Holy Spirit. He writes, thus Joseph, King James translation spells it J-O-S-E-S. -E thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement a Levite a native of Cyprus sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles feet amen and I want to use as a sermon title how to become an encourager how to become
become an encourager. One of the great tragedies of our time is that there appear, hear me, there appear to be so few kind people around. It appears that way in our culture, in our society, in our community, even in the church. So Reverend Flakes, where do you get that perspective? Ferguson, Missouri. It just appears. There are so few kind people around. Look in the political arena. Go to the White House. It just appears so few kind people. If I can just come and sit at your table, maybe you may want to look at your surroundings. Young people in college, does it appear that they're just few kind people. Not saying that there, there aren't kind people, but it just seems they are just so few. And sometimes even in our churches, when you would just think that everybody ought to be kind, It just seems to be so few kind people around. Even in our school system, our educational system. I look at football fields and soccer fields. And we look even in our justice system. It just seems to be so few kind. About, even in our families. Not coming to judge, but I am coming to really raise a level of prayerfully sensitivity and consciousness that we need to become encouragers. In the midst of so few kind people, there are plenty of mean spirited, hateful people. Don't ever think everybody likes you. Even though, as Christians, if we say that we are saved, not only are we to love, but we are to like them. I know some people say, well, I can love them, but I don't have to like them. That's the culture. You don't have to like their ways, but you are to like them. You may not like their attitudes, but you are. If you are a Christian, if you say that the love of God lives in and through you, But, but there appear to be very few who just take the time to be kind as a lifestyle. Not just be kind every now and then, because we can all do that. 
But if you are spiritually connected and you're spiritually growing, then kindness, encouraging, is a lifestyle. And the reason that I moved to really deal with this is because, see, we just left Thanksgiving. Did you all see Black Friday on TV? Walmarts, shopping centers, even in the in Europe, where they had black, they don't even have, they don't celebrate Thanksgiving, but they had a Black Friday. And let me just say, Black Friday don't have anything to do with your skin color. It has everything to do with Green Friday. <laughs> It's about economics. But did you see in Europe, in, 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 in Europe, where people, they had connected with Walmart and they had these plasma flat screen televisions, people were running, and not only in Europe, but also in the United States, people were getting in fights yeah. over material stuff. It just appeared. Very few who just don't take time to be kind as a lifestyle. Yet, yet I believe that, I believe that this is how every child of God, maturing Christians, ought to be as we are instructed. I know some people say, well, I don't have to be encouraging. That's the attitude of an unsaved person. I don't have to be kind to everybody. That's the attitude of an immature Christian. But I believe in my heart of hearts that this is how every child of God, maturing Christian, ought to be as we are instructed in. Where are we instructed in? We're instructed in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. You ought to write that down, young people. You ought to write it down, teenagers, young adults, middle ages, golden age. I don't believe we get so old that we just have to be unkind to people. We have to be so critical about everything. But listen to what Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32 says. And be ye kind one to another. Now, you have to basically settle the account. Do you believe that this is the word of God? Is this what governs and guide your life, your choices, your decisions? It continues to say forgiving one another. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You all need me to repeat that again? You all need to just give me, give me the scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. This is what Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 says. With all lowliness, with all meekness, humbleness, with long suffering, that means a long temper, patience. Forbearing one another in love. Do you have people who you see and you, you hear say, I just ain't going to put up with that person anymore. I don't have to take all of that. Are you all following me? Y'all tracking? But it says in Ephesians 4, 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with, with patience, forbearing one another in love. You know what that means? There may be somebody in your college, it may be somebody in your classroom, maybe somebody on your job, maybe somebody even in your home, your wife, your husband. It says that you will put up with them. You accept them, not tolerate them, you accept them. All of their flaws. That's what you said when you got married, for better or for worse. When did that change? When she didn't, when her shape got a little bit out of, when did it change? For better or for worse? When he started losing his hair, having to receive a lot, when did it change? When he lost his job and he can't give you all that you want, when did it change? 
when she's had two or three kids and now all of a sudden she's not able to do all the things that she was able to do before she had those two or three kids? When did it change? Forbearing one another. Young people, you need to learn how to forbear. And let me just say, you cannot do it by yourself. You have to ask yourself, which one am I? Because if you're not connected with God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, you will become so impatient with people, instead of encouraging them, you'll tear them down. Can we just be honest today? Real talk. Many people, young, middle-aged, golden age, are opinionated. I ain't talking about nobody. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. We say we're going to be real talk. Self-centered. I ain't talking about it. I'm just rude. And sometimes just plain mean in their dealings with others. And you know the sad part is, they may not even know it. Have you seen people who will look at you and not even speak to you? If we're going to be real. Have you seen people, they just seem not to have anything positive to say about absolutely nothing. How do we become encouragers? I, that's what I'm talking, I'm trying to get to. This ought not to be, especially among saved people, maturing people. And I believe that the Lord will have us to practice a ministry. Here's what I'm saying. Fourth Street, we need to make sure this ministry is vital. It is active. It is under the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what that ministry is? A ministry of encouragement. Talk to the person next to you and say, we need to make sure that we have a ministry of encouragement. And the question is, will you be available to be a part of this ministry? In these verses, we are introduced to a man named Joseph. It's in the text. And he is better known by the name Barnabas. When this man appeared on the scene in the early days of the church, he stepped out of obscurity doing good. And when he stepped off the stage a few years later, he exited doing what? Good as well. In fact, the Bible's record of this man's life and ministry reveals him as a man who had a heart to do good to all those with whom he came in contact with. Do you have a heart to encourage people to do good to those, every person you come in contact with, regardless of their color, regardless of their socioeconomic status, regardless of their level of education, regardless of whatever it is, do you have an attitude to want to do good? To be encouraging to those you come in contact with. Today, I would like for us to take a quick look at the life of Barnabas and share with you why he earned the name Son of Consolation. By the way, this name is very special. The word for consolation comes from the same word that is translated comforter. Which refers to the Holy Spirit in John 14, 26. You remember Jesus said, I'm going to pray that the Heavenly Father send the Holy Spirit. And he is also known as a comforter. Right. Refers to one who comes alongside of another to offer help and encouragement. And apparently Barnabas had earned the reputation among the disciples of Christ as one who was a helper and encourager of others. So here's my question. In order to become an encourager, what must you learn? The first thing that we must learn, we must learn to reach out and encourage the desperate. 
Have you ever found desperate people in your life? There is still a need for this kind of ministry today. We, we need to make the effort and time and take the time to reach out to those around us who seem to be lonely or who have been rejected by others. Have you, do you know anybody that have a sense and a fear of rejection? Persons that are alone? Even though they can be in a crowd, but they feel alone. Have you been in a crowd where you've been talking to your friends or you've been talking to your coworkers and you see somebody over there they're standing by themselves, nobody goes over to try and help connect with them? A lot of times in our churches, we can see people come in as guests and they don't know nobody and yet, come on somebody. Barnabas was an encourager. He reached out to Paul when he was called to be an apostle. Nobody wanted anything to do with Paul. Paul wanted to go to Jerusalem to be, become a part of the apostles there in Jerusalem. And because of Paul's reputation, Paul was known as one who would put people in jail. Paul was known as one in the name of Saul who would go and he would kill people in the name of the God. Nobody wanted to be around Saul, he had now become Paul. His reputation preceded him. They had not known that he was converted. He was changed. But there Barnabas is. Sometimes when we find out things about people and we thought one thing of them, but they trust you enough to let the guard down. And you found out that they weren't all that and what you might have thought they were. And all of a sudden you start distancing. Is there anybody in this house? There are people who just need to be encouraged. People who come to Columbus, they don't know anyone. They don't have family. And one place that you would think that will embrace them is the church. In order to become an encourager, you must learn to reach out, encourage the desperate. Here's the examining question. Does this describe your life and practice? Are you an encourager? Do you reach out to the desperate? Or do you just reach out to those? That's a part of your circle. You encourage those who encourage you. But do you really encourage those that you have no expectation? Does this describe your life and practice? We ought to find ourselves actively engaged in this ministry of encouragement. Then in order to become an encourager, you must learn to reach out and encourage the disciples. And who are the disciples? The disciples are those who declare that they are followers of Christ. The disciples are those who say that I am a learner of Christ. Again, there is a lesson here for us today. We ought to do everything under the power of the Holy Spirit to encourage other believers in their walk with the Lord. Do you not know when you start letting people know that I am truly a follower of God, not so much by what I say, but how I live, you won't start getting the telephone calls anymore. You won't be invited to all the social parties anymore. You won't get invited to the Christmas party. Let me just testify. I know. I used to get invited to everything. The fraternity parties, I got invited. If I didn't have a car, they came and picked me up. If I wanted to go to the club, I got a call. Are you going to be ready at 11 o'clock? I got the calls. 
After the football games, Cedric, I got the calls. Talif, I got the calls. Josh, I got the calls. Huh? And I believe those who know, you know what I'm talking about. You get the calls. But the minute they know that you're a disciple of Christ, not a disciple of them, not a disciple of the school, you're a disciple of Christ, the calls get less and less and less. And you need to have those around you who can encourage those who are standing for Christ. Because it can get lonely. And that's why so many young people, they're looking for places that they can belong. They can be a part of. And all my brothers and sisters, we need to make sure that they know they belong to the body of Christ. That we don't tear them down. We don't discourage them. We don't become petty of them. But we lift them up. Encourage them, exhort them. Barnabas was an exalter. He was an encourager. He lifted Paul up. He lifted those around him up. He made them feel good. Made them feel special. There are some people in this church who have the gift of just making people feel special. Not going to call their names, but you know who you are. They have a way of just encouraging people. They have a way of, of just, when they come in, when you come in their presence, when you leave them, you feel better. But have you had people, you come in their presence, and you hate you never went in? They don't have nothing to say good. They complain all the time. They picky about this. They picky about, a matter of fact, when you walk in their presence, they're already looking you up and down and looking at what you got on. Here's a litmus test. Parents, here's a litmus test, middle ages. Here's a litmus test, grandparents, great grandparents. If your grandchildren and your nieces and your nephews don't like coming around you, there should be a sign somewhere. If your children don't like coming near you and staying in your presence, there should be a sign somewhere that should give you some indication. I wonder why my own children don't like to sit down at the table with me, don't like to go to the movies, don't like to ride with me. There should be a sign that maybe you're not an encourager, but you're not someone that lifts up, but you're always tearing down. have to be careful with our children because they're fragile they need to be they need to be built up Reverend Small said in his in, in this in the children period say we all make mistakes don't expect your child to be perfect but when they make the mistake don't kill them spiritually Don't make them feel as though that's the last and only mistake they're going to make. They're going to make some more mistakes. They need someone there to correct them, yes, but correct them with love and correct them with kindness. Let them know that God is forgiving, but the only way they know he's forgiving, you must forgive them also. Show compassion. There are basically two types of people in every church. Y'all interested? I'm almost finished. One type seeks to find all the faults with others and the work of the church. They can and then they do their best to tear others down. You want to know the other one? The other type seeks to build up their church and fellow believers, and they seek to help them to grow in the Lord. The question is, which one are you? If we 
you're going to have the healthy church that God wants us to. He wants us to have a Barnabas spirit. He wants us to be able to encourage people. You know what? I know there's a lot that's wrong with me. That's number one. I used to think I was all that in a bag of chips and some more. I thought I was the best thing on God's green earth. And I thank God I had a daddy and a mama and I had a spiritual father in Dr. Dr. Cameron Madison Alexander. He, he helped humble me so much that he said the only thing you should ever begin to know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Is there anybody in this house? But we all, and if the truth be told, I believe some people out there think that you're the bag of chips and everything. Is there anybody in this house? There has to be some humbling that goes on. Let us know that we are not perfect. And I just want to say this to the husband and the wife. Why would God bring two imperfect people together that you say he brought you all together and you both expect each other to be perfect? Why is that? And that you think that you produce perfect children. Y'all don't get it. Let me say this again. Why would God bring two imperfect people together and then you expect each other to be perfect? And that you believe that you produce perfect children. You know why God brings two imperfect people together in holy matrimony? So that they can show his perfect love in them. It's not yours. If you're connected with God through Jesus Christ, he indwells you with his perfect love. Which means that you can't love that wife the way that God desires you to love her in your own strength. It'll frustrate you to death. You can't love that husband the way that God desires you to love him in your own strength. It will drive you absolutely to West Georgia. West Central Georgia, that is. That child that you think is gorgeous angelic and let me just say I don't believe in terrible twos either so let's just go ahead and put that off the plate they just become challenging <laughs> that's all that is but so were you is there anybody in this house because God says everything he makes is good so why we begin to label that which God says is good and we want to make it terrible because we have certain expectations right but, 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 but God desires that you show you his forgiveness through you towards that husband, towards that, that wife, towards your children, but also towards other family members and even those that are not a part of your family. He wants you to show his character through you. He's a loving God unconditionally. He's a forgiving God. He's a compassionate God. He wants you to show his encouragement through you. Who declare that you're saved, Holy Ghost filled, sanctified, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Here's another examining question that I want to leave you with. Which description best fits your life and your dealings with others? One who tears down one who exhorts, one who encourages, or one who's always critical. We need an environment where we encourage people. And when they make mistakes, we come alongside them. And with loving kindness, correct them. And then be there to support.
is there anybody in this house? But you know what we're so used to? We're so used to this cutthroat society that we're in. Ferguson, Missouri. Why would people destroy their own community? I, I can't understand. I can never say I understand their frustration because I have not had a sense of, 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 of death to happen, not only in my life, but in the life of a city. I was not here when Kenneth Walker, and that was one of the most tragic situations. As a matter of fact, it's almost as low. We have been given a taboo. You don't mention the name. You don't call that name because it generates something within a city that they are afraid that may explode because we haven't talked about the issues. So we keep it undercover. And in Ferguson, Missouri, because of the unkindness, instead of the encouraging, see, people who look at others as if they're animals, Life doesn't value anything. We have to, as the church, make sure that we don't perpetuate. We don't continue such attitudes among those of us who say that we are saved. We have to be an encourager. Even in the midst of death, and I respect the parents of Michael Brown when they say, do not make our son death a mockery. Yeah. Don't use this as an opportunity to be violent. But on the other hand, you got another parent who says, burn it down, burn it down, burn it down. And I don't understand the frustration. My heart goes out to him. But we have to be careful how we allow our anger to cause us to hurt other people. The Bible says be angry, but do not allow that anger to cause you to hurt other people. In order to be an encourager, you must learn to reach out and encourage the discouraged. Do you have people around you who are discouraged? Discouraged about their jobs, their job situation, discouraged about school, discouraged about their boo, their boo bed, discouraged about their home, their family, discouraged about the stress and the strain that they're experiencing, discouraged about themselves, discouraged about the condition that they find themselves in. We need to make sure that we can encourage them that God can make a way out of no way. We don't just jump on the bandwagon and say, well, honey, let's start just being misery in our own stuff. Misery loves company. Someone need to be a Barnabas and encourage each other. As I get ready to close, you remember over in Acts, the 15th chapter, verses 36 through 40. John Marks was a follower of Paul. And whatever John Marks did, Paul says, I don't want John March to follow me anymore. And Paul sent John March home. Many biblical scholars believe that John March was a relative of Barnabas Joseph. And because John March could not continue the journey with, with Paul, Barnabas did not give up on John March. Matter of fact, Paul John Mark is one of the prolific writers of the Synoptic Gospels, Mark's Gospel. But if Mark had given up, and if Barnabas had given up on John Mark's, uh, 
maybe we would not have the gospel according to Mark. Uh, but Paul was on his journey, and as he was coming to his last days in his ministry, uh, the Bible says that he sent for John Mark. And Paul came to understand, even though that John Mark was not as mature as he wanted him to be, he realized that John Mark had some value that he could bring to the ministry. But because of Barnabas' encouragement of John Mark, John Mark did not throw up the pass in Paul's face. And that's what we ought to learn, that sometimes we may dis disengage with certain people because they may not be where we want them to be at that certain time. But just because I'm angry with somebody, it does not mean you have to be angry with somebody. Is there anybody in the house? Let me just put it this way. Brother Small and I may have a good friendship. With Brother Allison, we have a good friendship. But Brother Small and I may have a disagreement but that does not mean that Brother Allison has to fall out with Brother Small. Is there anybody in the house? We have a culture that even if, if someone falls out with one cousin it means that the whole clan fall out. If someone fall out with a sister and you have three other sisters all other three other sisters you might not have done anything to those three other sisters uh, but those three other sisters uh, will fall out just because uh, you had a disagreement with the other sister. Uh, we need to get beyond that kind of mess. Uh, is there anybody in the house? Uh, and that's what Paul came to realize uh, is that Barnabas, uh, even though uh, things did not work out at first with Paul and John Mark, uh, Barnabas did not fall out with John Mark. Paul and Barnabas kept encouraging John Mark. He kept there with John Mark. He kept saying, hang in there, John Mark. Keep on the journey, John Mark. He didn't say you ought to fall out with Paul. You ought not to follow Paul. You ought to stay angry with Paul. You ought not forgive Paul. He didn't say anything against Paul, but allowed God to reconcile that relationship between Paul and John Mark. Mark, and I hear Paul saying, I realize that John Mark wasn't where I, he wanted, I wanted him to be. John Mark wasn't as mature as I wanted him to be. But over the years, Barnabas tell John Mark to come and visit me. Bring my parch, bring my bag, which said that John Mark, that I will accept you back John Mark, I forgive you. John Mark, I want to be an encourager to you. And I, I, I am so glad that God illustrated that he can reconcile relationships that are broken. And we can become an encourager while that person is discouraged. And I just come by to tell you, a songwriter said, be not dismayed made or whatever be time God will take care of you when everybody else walk away from you I just want you to know the songwriter says God will take care of you that's why we keep going to his word his word encourages us when you feel disappointed when you feel discouraged when you feel nobody's in your corner you you need to understand uh, God is an encourager, uh, but you know what he desires of his disciples. Uh, he wants you uh, to be an encourager too. Uh, when he lifts you up, uh, he wants you to lift somebody else up. Uh, when he exhorts you, uh, he wants you to exhort somebody else. Uh, but I've got to go now. Uh, do you know the ultimate encourager? Uh, do you know the one that encourages us the most? Uh, I want to tell you, uh, he 
knew our condition. He knew our state. He knew our lostness. He knew our loneliness. He knew we weren't fit to die for. But I'm so glad that he came down through 42 generations. That ought to be encouraging by itself. That he loved us so much that he was willingly to leave his throne in glory. To come into a sin sick world. Conceived in the womb of a virgin called Mary. By the Holy Spirit. He walked the dusty streets of Palestine. He was encouraging to a man who was sitting at the pool of Bethesda for 38 long years. He encouraged him to pick up his bed and walk. He gave blind, he gave a blind Barnabas his sight. He encouraged him. He encouraged a woman who had 12 years on the issue of blood. And yet he turned around and said, Woman, your faith has made you whole. Isn't that encouraging? He didn't look down on her. He didn't put her down. She was ostracized. But he stopped and took some time to be an encourager to that woman. Is there anybody in the house who truly want to know how to become an encourager? Keep looking to the cross because it's at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. It was there by faith. I received my sight. And now I am happy. I'm joyous all the day. He died on that Friday. Anybody know he died for the sinner? That's encouraging because it says to me that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his best. He gave excellence. For God so loved the sinner. For God so loved the drug addict. For God so loved the alcoholic. For God so loved the prostitute. For God so loved the sinner. For God so loved the doctor. For God so loved the lawyer. For God so loved that wayward mother. For God so loved that wayward sinner. That child who's disobedient to his parents. For God so loved the whole wide world. He gave his only begotten son. That whosoever that's encouraging to me. Is that encouraging to you? Whosoever. Whosoever means you don't have to have a degree. Whosoever. You don't even have to have a job. You can be homeless upon the breeze. No, whosoever. You can be homeless. You can become on somebody. Even an immigrant in the United States. For God so loved the world. You can be white. And you can be black. You can be as, 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 as a Hispanic. You can be an Asian. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, shall have everlasting life. That's some encouraging news to me because I just come by to tell you that death is going to come every one of our ways. And it's good to know that since I've met Jesus, he's a part of my life. He's in my life. I don't have to worry about death coming to my door. I don't have to worry about cancer knocking on my door. I don't have to worry about a stroke or a heart attack taking me out because I've come to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And the Bible says those who die in Christ shall live again. That's encouraging news unto me. And I'm so glad that he died on that Friday. I'm so glad that he locked his head in his shoulder and gave up the ghost. 
I'm so glad that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went to Pilate, requested encourage his body, put him in a bar or two. And I'm so glad that he stayed there all Friday night just for me and just for you. I'm so glad that he stayed there all Saturday and Saturday night. I'm so glad that he Sunday morning, he was raised from the dead with all power, encouraging power. When I get down, he'll lift me up. When I become disappointed, he'll lift me up. When I become despaired, he will lift me up. All power. No matter what comes my way, no matter how difficult the challenges are, even if everybody walks away from me, I can be encouraged in knowing that my Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, reminded by the Holy Spirit in His Word, that He loves me. He cares just for, for me. And you ought to put your name there. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're into right now. I don't know if you're desperate. I don't know if you're discouraged. But you ought to know that there's an encouraging word that God loves you. Encouraging word. God watches over you. God sustains you. God desires that you be an encourager to everyone that you come in contact with. But you must encourage the desperate. You must encourage the disciple. And you must encourage those who are in despair. Are you an encourager? And let me just say, you cannot do it by yourself, but you must receive Jesus Christ's encouraging spirit. The only way that you can receive his encouraging spirit, first you must receive him. You must accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That you might be saved. And he gives you his Holy Spirit that encourages you.